Emily Pine, Emily is a professor of modern drama in the School of English Drama and Film in University College Dublin. And she has published widely as an academic and critic. She is the author of the award winning essay collection Notes to Self, which has been translated into 15 languages. And most recent, her most recent novel is Ruth and Penn, which is also very, very successful. And she'll be interviewed by her own Sinead Hussey. Uh, Sinead needs no introduction. Yeah, but I give her one anyhow. Uh, so Sinead is the Midland correspondent for uh, RTE and she began her career uh, with the local channel site here. So I don't think I need to say anything more about Sinead because uh, every time we turn on television she seems to be there. Uh, so I, I'd like to invite them onto the stage now. And afterwards there'll be questions. So if you want to, to, uh, to ask any questions about Emily or Sinead, Please be free. So we'll begin. Um, Emily, thank you for, for being here this evening. And um, your journey to writing was, I suppose, 40 years in the making. Um, so why at 40 um, did you, I suppose, publish something? Because I know you've, you know, you've been writing for, for quite some time, but that was your first published work. Yeah, so I, I kind of have two answers to this, and that's going to become repetitive because I always have two answers to everything, and I think that's either because I'm really indecisive or because I'm a teacher, so I'm used to like trying to get students to think about things from two different angles. So the two answers are that I had, as you alluded to, wanted to write creatively. I mean, if you had asked me when I was 16 what I was going to do, it was going to be writer, right? But as lots of people have said already, that can be a hard or challenging path to go down and it can feel like not very straightforward. And I also came from a background that meant that once I finished college, I really needed a job, right? I needed an income and, and all of those things. And so I, I just shelved, put writer um, to one side. And then I guess you get to a certain kind of point in your life and you realize that the things that you shelved are maybe the things you should have pursued. And so I realized that I was I kind of have said, oh, I'm fine with that. I, I just, I'll be an academic. I love my job and I love teaching and everything. Um, but it kind of no longer was enough. And then this other thing happened and it was 10 years ago and it was 2013. And my dad, who had been an alcoholic all my life, um, went into liver failure and very nearly died. And the, the plot spoiler of Next to Self is that he survived. <laughs> Yay! Um, that's the happy ending. I mean, the real happy ending is that I got a book out of it, right? <laughs> um, because I ended up kind of spending a year with him in and out of intensive care. And kind of, I had been expecting it my whole life, but also, you know, not knowing what would happen when it came, this crisis. And after he got out of hospital and he came off the liver transplant list, like a year into this um, kind of crisis, I realized that even though we were, he was healthier and amazingly hasn't had a drink since and, and, and everything, I still had all of these conflicted emotions kind of running around inside my brain and my body. And the only way that I could cope with those was to get them onto a page, like literally a page. It was like, literally felt like taking something out of my body and putting it onto a page. It's kind of visceral emotion. And I've heard so many people who have written autobiographically or fictionally or through poetry, you know, talking about how it's like a volcano. You know, when you just, like, there's no stopping the words. And I remember sitting in bed with my laptop just just typing like you know the laptop was gonna like burst into flames because there was just like doing the keyboard um and i never intended to publish it and i put it in a drawer um, and it was that i my partner was looking for something and he found it and he read it and he said you know this is really good and he said you know this is also this is about a daughter coming to terms with her dad's addiction and illness and you know maybe it might help someone else and and that appealed to me but it was also and i've again i've heard it from the other writers this evening it's amazing how much we have in common right i also think that it's so rare that we're told that something we've done is good and there he was saying i've read this and it's really good and that made the world a difference to me okay it's a tiny bit biased because you know it's my house and um, but I, I was really lucky, I sent it to a publisher, uh, Tram Press, and uh, small Irish publishers are 
doing amazing work, right? It is just, like Penguin would not have had any time. They don't take unsolicited manuscripts. But small Irish presses do, they're incredible in journals and festivals like this, do so much work to help writers who need a start. And so I sent it to Tramp Press and they said, we would like, a, we like it and, and we'd like a book. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and like on the bus on the way home, wrote a list of other things that I was clearly dying to, to write about, including, you know, my job and kind of my life. And also I had just gone through a period of years that my partner and I were trying to have children and we weren't able to have children. And again, these are the kind of stories that I think we carry, right? And that we're silent about. And that are and that we write off as mundane or everyday experiences or things that other people wouldn't wouldn't be couldn't be interested in because surely everyone has the thing that they carry. Um, and so we kind of consult as well as you know the rest of the world silencing us, we can silence ourselves. And so I guess I got to a point where I needed a kind of turning point. I was turning 40 and you know apparently that's a significant age. And also you know, my dad was like dying and then he was alive and trying to work out what to do with that. And I wanted to be a parent and I couldn't and trying to work out what to do with all of that longing. And I ended up, I ended up writing and it's, it's kind of been extraordinary. So, you know, I, Sinead Leeson and I, who is an amazing journalist and writer, and she often says, you know, you don't have to publish it, but the writing of it is a really important, a really important thing to do. And the thing about yours to self, as you said, it's very honest. Um, and I think that's why it really struck a chord with readers. Um, and I just wonder, why were you so honest and so giving of, of, of stories and, and a journey, several journeys that were, you know, was it painful for you to write? Was it difficult to get all that out there? Or was it in some way therapeutic to, to get out? I mean, all of the above, right? Um, I. <laughs> People don't really believe me when I say that, when I, they say, you know, why is it so honest? So I'm like, well, I just I don't know any other way to be, right? If I was, either I was not going to tell the story or I was going to tell the story fully, right? I just don't, I didn't, I don't have, and I still don't, even with fiction, like, I just don't have a kind of middle gear. Um, and the publishers asked me if I were, if I wanted to publish it under a pseudonym. <laughs> which probably should have been a sign that it was being a little bit too honest, right? <laughs> when you wrote this new sure. Um, and, but again, I just needed to claim it. I needed to claim that experience. And that was vital to me. And I think that is what people responded to. And so it was kind of an extraordinary thing. And it was published in 2018. It was published in the wake of the referendum um, on uh, repealing the uh, uh, Eighth Amendment. And I think that was a real moment in Irish society where people, lots of people were telling their stories and lots of stories that had been silent and quiet for a very long time were being listened to. And I thought it was an extraordinary act of empathy, that act of listening. And so then after it was published in July 2018, um, I just started getting letters and from people who were telling me their stories. And that's the sign, I think, of all of these untold moments and this kind of, again, opening up that I think we've seen in the last 10, 15 years in Irish society, which has been magnificent, but also very difficult, right? And, uh, so yes, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm really delighted that I was honest. If I had known in advance, you know, <laughs> that I would be talking about incredibly personal things in front of an audience, <laughs> um, I, I, I might not have done it. I think there's a kind of, there's a gift to, when you're writing, there's a gift to not thinking about reception, right? And a gift to not think, like you have to think about your reader because you want to try and make it good, but actually trying not to think of a reader is the best thing maybe you can do. And what did your family think? Because I know from reading the book, you know, you do try not to delve into their lives too much, but, but because of the nature of the stories, I mean, they are part of the story. What do they think? Yeah, well, I have this wildly eccentric family. So A, they give me lots of material. Um, and B, also, um, you know, it's hugely supportive to be doing it. And it was strange, you know, my dad, is a, my dad writes for the Irish Times and is, you know, has, was an academic and that's how I thought that becoming an academic was normal, right? And he worked for RT for his whole career. And um, he, 
So, so, so that was kind of already there as a model, and he had written about his experience being in hospital and everything for the, for the, the Irish Times Health Supplement, which we all thought was hilarious. Um, and, uh, so that kind of gave me a bit of permission, right? And for, it was harder to watch my mum go through it. My mum's from a generation where if something happens that's dark or difficult in a family, you close. Right? You close ranks and you mind each other, but you also shut out any oxygen to it. And so she said, I can understand why you'd want to write about this only, but I don't understand why you'd want to publish this, right? And she was also really worried for me. She saw how women who tell their stories in the world can get treated, right? And I think it's really great that I'm, I have no social media presence whatsoever, so I've been somewhat protected from that. Um, the publishers, uh, Tramp Press, published it because I'm a university teacher, published it in the summer so I wouldn't have to publish it one day and then get up and stand in front of a room full of 19 year olds the next day who might have just read about me, you know, their teacher having sex or something. Um, so that was a kind of protective gesture as well. Um, my, I, I mean, my mum was hugely relieved when I said, oh, I'm writing a second book, and she said, really? <laughs> and I said, it's a novel. She was like, oh. um, So I think it was an act of permission, but also, you know, they were concerned. Um, and when you write about your own life, you inevitably trespass in other people's lives. And so the only kind of rule I had was that I have the right, I felt, and I still feel, to write about anything I had experienced. But I didn't have the right to write about anybody else's emotions. And so even in the essay, the chapter about my partner and I having children, like he's obviously present in that. But only but I, I, I worked really hard not to write about how hard it was for him, even though it was. And so, you know, then when I came to write Ruth and Penn and Ruth, um, it's, which is about two characters, um, Ruth is uh, in her 40s. <laughs> total departure from my life, really. Um, and she and her husband can't have children. And um, Pen is a Penelope, a 16-year-old girl. But um, I wrote a lot of Ruth's husband's story um, because it really felt important to me to acknowledge some of the things that I had left out of the non-fiction that I could do in fiction. And also, um, I should say that I started writing with Pen I was writer in residence at the National Maternity Hospital um, in Dublin in Hollis Street. And I was really taken aback then, and that was pre-COVID. Um, I was really taken aback by how many men were being excluded from the process. So, you know, they're obviously not physically given birth, but they're, you know, excluded from the hospital or in cases where, and this is something that Aidan says in the novel, in cases where um, there's a, a pregnancy loss, Met fathers are not entitled to counselling unless they go with the mother. So if the mother doesn't take up counselling, then fathers aren't entitled to it. I find that extraordinary. And I found it extraordinary when I expressed my surprise that no one in the hospital found it weird. I just, I, all of the men, both fathers and not fathers that I know, are, are, so, are so emotional, are so open, and are so, you know, engaged and the idea that men aren't allowed, literally aren't allowed outlets for that, still, I think, is, 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 is part, of, part of a problem, right? Anyway, sorry, I could go, I could go on. <laughs> but it's, it's, I guess what I'm trying to say is that sometimes you're writing out of your own experience, like direct experience, and sometimes as a writer you're trying to capture some, bit, some kind of moment of injustice maybe you see in the world. I read in, in one of your interviews, or maybe I watched online, where you said you, you, you tricked yourself into writing a novel and you almost didn't, I suppose, set out to do it. So how did it come about? So um, I, I opened, I, I, <laughs> this is going to sound really silly, but because I had, or I had published a book and there I was, and I had taken a year off my job, right, in order to be um, writer in residence. And I, um, I don't know if you know the playwright Marina Carr, and uh, so, you know, somewhat intimidating presence. And she had been the previous writer in residence many years ago. And they had had one for ages. And I, um, I was totally at sea. I didn't know what to do as a, as a writer in residence, because I'm, I'm a teacher, right? And uh, I bumped into Marina Carr, who I'd never met before at an event. She went to an event, and I thought, ooh, I'll go up to her, right? And I went, hi. And she, you know, 
you know, can I touch you? And, um, and she said, how's it going? I said, you know, I'm doing this thing now. And she said, how's it going? And I said, oh God, I'm totally lost. And she said, oh, great. <laughs> and I was like, no, not great, not great at all. <laughs> being lost is terrible. And she, she said, oh, being lost is where the good, good stuff comes from. And I said, like, okay, this is what a real writer thinks. And so I went back to the desk and I'm still lost and scared and didn't know what to do. And so I opened um, a file on my computer that said, um, short crap novel. And uh, draft one, and that was my way into like, and 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 I actually, I didn't really write it on. I opened the file on the computer, and then I took out. Um, I like to write by hand, partly because I uh, am a really fast typist. I paid my way through college by typing, and so I type too fast. I, I can type slightly faster than my brain, which I think you need to write slower than your brain. I don't know. So I handwrite, and also in my head, that's the more the romantic idea of the writer. So when he sits in a cafe, you know the writing. Um, and I write in those, um, school, do you remember school copy books? Do you remember the Ashling or the Orman school copy books? Yeah, with the big, fat, chunky lines that you can fill pages really easily, right? So these are all these kind of strategies I thought I needed to trick myself into not being intimidated by this crazy project. And I just said, okay, you just have to write four Ashling copy book pages a day. And, and I did, and I just, I wrote all of Ruth's story, and then I found Ken, and I wrote all of Ken's story, and then, and now they're into work. Um, but yeah, short, short crack novel, highly recommend um, setting your expectations really low. <laughs> and you came on the back of notes yourself where you're saying, you know, people are coming up to you, offloading their story, writing to you with their story. Did you feel safer to write fiction? You know? Yes, I mean, I've got, I think it's a really insightful question um, because I, I felt the honesty of notes to self was incredibly important and I was incredibly moved and I found, I mean, I wondered you feel the same in your line of work, like, that it's a privilege when someone gives you their story, right? And it's an act of trust and that's extraordinary and I've never, ex I mean, obviously with students, yes, but I never experienced it quite like this. And I, what I realised as well is that most people just want to be heard. Right? They don't want to answer a solution or, you know, a revolution. They just want to be heard because they don't. So that was an amazing journey. But it was also, you know, it took something. It cost something from me. And you mentioned earlier, like, is it hard to go back? And it is hard to go back. And, you know, there were, I just had, I had to get to the point where I just, just to stop. And writing fiction was like being able to explore the emotional territory but taking it at a it's not out of my body anymore. It's, it's over there. And that was, and it was also fun to be able to write things that weren't true. I didn't have to worry. I not to kind of think, oh God, did that really happen? You could, and amazingly, like you can change things in fiction, like the license to just, you know, do things. So, and I, but I also think, you know, fiction, I had a student years ago who was writing um, uh, a she wanted to write a memoir. And she was hitting writer's block over and over again. And then and we kept talking about this and kept talking about, you know, ways for, around. And, and the stories she had to tell were incredible. <laughs> it's a very difficult, very painful stories. And she went back to America and she went back to America and she sent me an email a while later and she said, I finished the manuscript and I said, wow, that's amazing. She'd gone from like, writer's block and like a hundred words you know, dragged out of her. And to you know, a full manuscript of like sixty thousand words or something, and um, she turned it into fiction. Fiction had been her way to tell her story more truthfully than she could in not in non-fiction, right? In in a memoir, because the memoir was too difficult. She was terrified her mother would read it, and it was so like, and realize it. And so write a novel and that, and set it somewhere else. And, can give the characters different names, right? And suddenly she was set free. So I think fiction can do really interesting things um, that can be incredibly true. And just looking then at how you feel about Penn, who was an autistic teenager, um, how, did you, how did you work on developing that character? Did you, I assume you had to do research, you know, what, were you, did you feel that you were supposed to really portray that character as best as you possibly could? 
Yeah, 100%. So Penn is 16 and I knew that from the start of thinking about writing about her. And my, it's funny, with my sister, I, so I wrote with Penn during lockdown, right? So when we all were confined and my sister and I um, would just talk on the phone every day. And she's a single parent, so she was at home with her four-year-old, you know, just the two of them. And, it was, and she's trying to work online at the same time. It was all very intense. So we would talk for an hour every day on the phone and I would, you know, fill her in on my incredibly boring life and then mostly she would get to talk about, like, you know, uh, my nephew. And, uh, but I would say things about what I was writing and I said, oh, you know, I think, I think Penn might be autistic and my sister has zero time for my, the, what she calls the magic woo-woo, Emily, um, of writing. And, uh, and she goes, but you're making her up, surely you know this. And I think there is that interesting interplay right, between subconscious and conscious when you're when you when you're creating something. So I really felt that Penn's had something more interesting to say and the way of looking at the world. And so that started to become that she was an autistic character. Now, my godson is autistic and quite profoundly autistic, and his mother is my best friend and. I, she had just talked for so long about how hard it is to fight for her son and for him to be seen and to be recognised and to be treated well and so on. And, I, and she just talked so much about how, when I, when I told her that um, I was writing a novel with a, a, an autistic character in it, she said, I'm like, thank you, not in that way, but in that, she said, we just need representation, right? So I did a ton of research in terms of reading and, you know, I'm a researcher, so I'm like looking and reading articles and so on. And I started to realize that so many of those articles are written by experts who aren't autistic themselves, right? And so I started going through Facebook groups and social media and just started to talk to people and things. And then and I was really lucky that uh, I had been to see a play called What I Don't Know About Autism, which is by a play by playwright and actor Jodie O'Neill. And Jodie was diagnosed as autistic in her late 30s, at like 38 or 39, because her son had been diagnosed as autistic. So she had this really late in life diagnosis because girls are socialized into masking a lot of neurodiverse behaviors, right? So they're trained to hold eye contact and they're trained to react in empathetic ways, in ways that boys aren't, again, with this kind of gender inequality. And so girls get diagnosed much later, or in the case of Jodie, but not at all until, um, you know, she's an adult. And so she'd written this amazing play about, um, all performed by autistic actors and uh, performed in a really neurodiverse kind of setting and and so I talked to her as a creator and she she read the manuscript and gave me loads of really interesting feedback and in publishing they sometimes call this the sensitivity reading right the idea being that we need to work out what the sensitivities are and I think that's a really bad label for it right we, it's actually an expert reading right Jodi is autistic and she's an artistic person so She's also then became the actor who read the audiobook. So she narrates the audiobook, and that was really beautiful, kind of full circle. Um, so, yeah, it was really important to me. The other part of it is that I haven't had an undiagnosed neurodiversity, which is that I'm dyspraxic, which I was diagnosed as a child with what it was then called clumsy child syndrome. I think we can agree that dyspraxia is a much nicer title, right? <laughs> But clumsy child syndrome is quite useful in the term because it does what it says on the tin, right? I just basically bump into things all the time. And um, it's one of the reasons why I wear really bright colors so I don't get lost. <laughs> um, but the, uh, I, I'm, I made pen dyspraxic as well. And again, that sense of, you know, I have a, I'm not autistic at all, but I have a tiny insight into how the world doesn't work. If you have any neurodiversity, the world doesn't work the way that it's meant to for neurotypical people. And I had a dyspraxic student recently, I didn't know that she was dyspraxic, and she'd missed a couple of classes, the first classes in term. This is, you know, last September. And I emailed her and I said, you know, I noticed you're missing class. And UCD is the biggest university in Ireland, and it has a huge campus, and she could not find the room. And so I met her at a landmark that she named and we found the room together and she came to every single class after that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean, like just that sense of um, what listening can do, right? And she, if I hadn't asked her, she, and if I hadn't also, that's the other thing that I do now as a teacher, 
things I say at the beginning of classes and courses, and I say them in emails. I am dyspraxic, so if anybody here has any neurodiverse issues, I'm your person. And she said, I would never have said it to anyone except that. So it's, it's again, this ways that we mask and the ways that we hide, and how when we stop hiding, it's, it can be so hard to stop hiding, but it can also just open up the world to us in ways um, that can be just life-changing. We touched on it earlier on, and it's been touched on here this evening, you know, that self-doubt, judgment. And um, how do you deal with that? Um, putting something out there, what, what is it like? <laughs> and, well, you're a public person, right? I mean, that's an area of vulnerability that I, I hadn't anticipated. And, like, I was incredibly lucky with notes to self that I didn't have the kind of backlash that I know that lots of people who publish work that is in some way taboo, right, um, can be. Uh, I don't know why that was. I wonder if maybe it's that I was slightly older and telling a story, a retrospective story. Um, and, you know, and also for as much as the stories I told in it about alcoholism and sexual violence and so on are still taboos, I'm also, you know, middle class white straight woman, right? So I was protected, I think, in lots of ways. Um, but I, I do think, and this is what I was saying earlier, I do think that making work is this incredible license to be yourself and this incredible way of encountering the world. Um, but I do think it costs something as well. And that's, you know, why the celebration of writing and art that this festival has been and this whole evening has been. It feels like a community. And it's actually these kinds of events and these kind of moments where um, that connection feels like it balances any cost out completely. So I think, for me, the, the people that I got to meet through this, which was not the goal, right? The goal is to write something, but actually the real dividend has been meeting people. And that, that's incredible. And do you find, even you know, since you've you, you published a note to self, which was about 2018, are people still coming up to you talking and, 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 and telling stories? Yes, they and um, I am, um, you know, if, I mean, hopefully quite a good listener at this point so you know um, but i also i have an email address that because i work for a university it's publicly available i just get emails every week if not almost every day still is that a huge responsibility or, or how do you handle it now yeah it is a responsibility so the one of the other things that i do in what i think of as my real job as an academic um, is i run a with the national photo collection at ucd we run a project called, uh, an oral history project called Survivor's Stories, and um, to work with people who are survivors of uh, institutions in Ireland and run by the Catholic Church. So industrial schools, mother and baby homes, and um, imagine and laundries. And people come to CD and we record their stories. And these are, many of these people have already told their stories, but they tell their stories to the commissions of inquiry. But as we know from all of the media coverage and so on, um, and the debates in the door, those uh, stories, their stories are then taken away from them and are put in sealed um, archives for 75 years and many people feel that they've, that they've been disempowered by the process and so we've had an incredible experience of them coming to UCD and they tell their story and we record it and they get the audio recording and then we transcribe it and they get a whole bound copy of their own story. And I had this amazing experience with this man who had been had terrible experiences going through but first a mother and baby home and then an industrial school and he came to me and, and he told his story to us. And like, people can talk for 20 minutes or they can talk for, one woman talk for three days. And she just came back day after day. And, but he, he talked for an afternoon and he told us his, his, his life story and uh, we transcribed it and we gave it to him. And um, he would be a very you know, reticent man. And then I met him later and I bumped into him at an art gallery because he, he is a huge art fan and a painter himself. And uh, he said that he'd given the book to his sons and he had never been able to tell them what had happened to him. So they had no idea. And that they were able to read it. And so that experience of, of listening and then enabling someone else's story to be heard, I think, 
again, it wasn't something I ever set out to do, but I think this is, this is the work of my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, which writers have influenced your writing or your thinking? Um, okay, so a really, really lovely moment for Ruth Penn was that, um, if I'm like, oh, my little book, um, my, that it won the Kate O'Brien First Novel Award um, this spring in Limerick, uh, which was an amazing festival and a lovely moment. Because Kate O'Brien, um, for uh, anyone who doesn't know, she was writing in the 30s and 40s mostly in Ireland, and um, she wrote about Ireland and she wrote about Spain, and uh, she was kind of amazing. Um, and she, but she was also banned in her lifetime, right? So her, two of her novels were banned. So it was a decade where people couldn't read her work. But I studied her when I was 18 in college in my first year and um, I'm doing a degree and she has a novel called Land of Spices and it has like a, a little girl in it who um, goes to, and it's, I'm reminded of the short story you were talking about, it's a, set in the convent um, and it's the, the central characters are a nun and one of the little girls in the boarding school. And she grows up through the course of the novel, it's kind of building for a man. And at the end of it, she starts to imagine herself becoming a writer. And I read that at 18, and I remember thinking, A, I love this writer, I think I love Kate O'Brien. Go and read the Kate O'Brien novel, and read Land of Spices, or Mary the Bell. Um, amazing um, novels. Mary the Bell set in Spain, so it's even more fun. Um, but uh, also loving that writer and loving her style, and then loving what she did for the woman with for a female narrative voice right in it. And I it's funny, one of the things when Trant Press said to me, um, we'd really wanted to publish a book. We'd love to commission a book by you. And I said, they said, we love your style. And I said, I don't have a style, right? That's just how it sounds in my head. And they said, that is your style, Emily. And I had just thought that because I didn't sound like John Barnville or Anne, Anne Enright, then, you know, I, wasn't, I couldn't write, like I wasn't a writer, right? That, like, I just wasn't a teacher much in that way. And so, again, the enabling things that other people say, but also, you know, that we read, like, reading widely and just finding something that sounds and you think, oh, I could maybe do that. Can't, can't do Anne Enright, but I could maybe do that. Yeah. What would you say to someone who has aspirations to, to write a book? Oh, you know, open that short graph and I'll file, right? Um, you know, it's been oversaid, but I guess start doing it. And if you need to do it in secret, if you need to do it almost in secret from yourself, if you need to write it in a children's copy book, or if you want to write it on your phone, on the bus, like, you know, just find find a way that works for you and <coughs> allow yourself that thing that that story you just told about style, like allow yourself to believe that you're a writer, right? Are you a person who can write? Then you're a writer, right? So yeah, I would just let, let's get rid of the gatekeeping. <laughs> Will we turn over to the floor then for questions? Is there anyone who wants to ask a question? Like, or share an experience of writing right? <laughs> Yeah, how you doing? Well done today, well done, Emily. Uh, <laughs> no, sorry, I don't think I need the mic. My voice carries the thing well enough. No, well done on your book. I came to your book through our bookshop that I'm involved in at home. I brought for the border from Roscommon this evening, so I'm kind of. But, um, and I thought it was a wonderful book, and I really, really was impressed by your honesty. But the question I have for you is this, was it difficult for your times when you were dealing with very personal stuff that was related to your life to put that down on paper sometimes? Did you ever feel, you know, I'm going too far here or I have to step back from it? Or, and you talked, you know, about your honesty and, and the honesty that forces course through loads of self. But was there ever times you felt this is too much and you had began to reconsider or began to, you know, check yourself almost in terms of the process of writing the book? Because it is hugely honest and, and, it's, and it's hugely revealing as well. But were the times when you were speaking about that as well, Jeremy? Um, I'm going to say yes and no. Right. Two responses. Um, <laughs> the first is that, so the writing, is an essay, it's the, it's the fifth chapter in the book, and it's about me being a child and a teenager. And it was the hardest to write, partly because it's long ago, right? And it was like pulling things up from the depths. Mm. Um, 
And the reason it was pulling things up from the depths was not just the vagaries of memory, but there were experiences, I and mean, I'm particularly thinking here of violence, right, that I had experienced as a 15 and 16 year old girl. And that I had sealed away very carefully in the box with a lid firmly on the top, so that I, and I think a lot of survivors do this, that I could survive, right? It's a really useful strategy in the moment and to move on. And I then, it's strange, it's when notes to self came out, people said, oh, you know, is it different from your academic work? I have spent my whole academic career doing things like this oral history project, right, with people who have experienced abuse and violence, with teaching plays that are about vulnerability and experiences of violence. And when that question was asked, I said, oh, it's totally separate, it's totally different. I didn't realise that in lots of ways I had been trying to find an expression for those experiences. When it came to writing them, I would, so I kind of write upstairs, we have a very small house, and I write upstairs in what was meant to be a child's room, right? So the irony is not lost on me. And, and um, my partner, who's also a writer, which is a lot of fun in our house sometimes, two writers, um, that would write downstairs. And I would come downstairs and I would just stand and breathe in the room with him because it was so intense. And he, and I, like almost shaking. And, uh, and he would say, are you okay? And do you want to stop? And, you know, we'd have a banana or something. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'd go back and I'd do short bits. And I would say that to anyone um, who is writing something that might be difficult or painful, like to, okay, I know I said the secret thing rather than secret, but if, there, if you are, do go in somewhere hard to have someone who is an ally, right? And also to take breaks. Um, we need an emotional toolkit, I think, for not even just writing, but for reading difficult work, right? And it says to students when we're studying um, plays. And there were times when I thought about not including that. And one of the things, again, the conversations that I had with the publisher, they said, let's put that chapter fifth in the book so that you feel a little bit less exposed Right, so I, I felt like the first two essays are about my life as an adult and I felt like readers would get to know me and know that I had survived and then they would get to my teenage self who had gone through those experiences. So it was, there were lots of like mini decisions as well about how to actually publish the work. Um, but yeah, and, and then the flip side of that is that one of the sides of, of the success of notes was I ended up being, you know, and 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 I was happy to do it, uh, being on radio shows and being on TV and stuff, talking and being at events and talking about sexual violence. And it got to a point where I said, I just this is really traumatizing for me now, and um, it's no longer enabling, and I'm going to stop it. And so I would say we have the right to write our own stories, and we have the right to tell our stories, but we also have the right actually to stop, mm -hmm. and the right to be quiet sometimes too. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Now, I'm, besides you, Ellie, it's a third book on the horizon. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> That's the hardest question of all time. Um, you know, extra short crack novel. No, um, I am taking another leave of absence from my job in September for another year. So I'm really hoping there is another. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to have a very nice time catching up on daytime television. Um, but uh, yeah, I would. I would really. I, I, I have really enjoyed this part of opening this whole part of my life. And it's also been a way for me to move away from, like I was, you know, I totally burned out at work. It's also been a way for me to connect with other parts of myself. And so sometimes I think that writing is sitting at the desk and writing, but sometimes it's going for a walk and sometimes it's reading and sometimes it's singing and sometimes it's yoga. <laughs> you know, that I just would like that to be that kind of holistic sense as well of my life, um, which is totally fudging your question, <laughs> um, but I, I don't know yet, but I hope so, yes. Thank you very much. Honestly, I'm very wonderful writer. Thank you. 
I'm going for your shenanigans. Oh. <laughs> Start the job going. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I only found one myself actually. <laughs> so I was never in. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm quite happy. Doing one. Joke. <laughs> so you would consider a collaboration with your partner in the right on a, on a book. Oh. <laughs> I mean, he's not here, so I can say anything, right? <laughs> um, we have an amazing deal where we are each other's first readers, and we write very, very differently. Um, he is just finishing a book, which is a history of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland since 1784, 500-page book. I write very short books. He writes very long books. Um, but, but, yeah, so I think one of the things... And again, this is, you know, they, we may be probably over honest, but one of the things we did in the wake of not becoming parents, um, which was hard for both of us, was to recalibrate, and we had to, right? And try to work out, okay, what do we have to give to each other? And um, that is not this thing. Right? And one of those things is a life of creativity together. And so we read each other's work, we read other people's work, we talk about them. We are currently reading a short story collection um, by Fergus Cronin, who won the short story prize um, last year, um, called Night Vision. Uh, Night Music, sorry. And then we'll both read the story and then we'll like, go for a walk and talk about the story, right? So it really, it, yeah, it, that's a wonderful way to live. Um, I think we would uh, come to blows if we tried to fight. <laughs> So, um, yeah, that, that's how we influence the work. Yeah. Yeah, it's a slightly different question, I suppose, on moving from personal essay to fiction. And it's uh, like when you're saying, we're talking to the, the two ladies in the tram, and they were saying, but you have a style. Mm -hmm. and yes, you do, of course you do. Uh, your style is your voice. When you look to fiction of these two characters, um, regardless of whether it's first person or third person, you kind of have to in, inhabit their voice, which is like your voice, yeah. regardless of style. How easy was it for you to find two other voices? Lovely question, because actually third person was really important to me, sure. right? It's that sense of the, di the distance. Um, I found Penn's 16-year-old's voice much easier to get out. And um, partly, I think, also, I mean, you're not probably not going to say this about characters and makeup, but I love Anne. Mm. I, I just love her. And it was just fun to write this person who has a difficult time with the world, but also just encounters the world. Like, she's so brave. She just goes out there. She just meets the world, like, on her terms as much as possible. And I loved writing her. That kind of came. I had the first line of her first chapter. I just had. And you know the way sometimes the first line, and that's kind of all you need. And I was really struck by the story you read, the voice, and like I fully believed that voice. And it's that, it's the the way she says, a breakdown is when you stop speaking, right? Because that sense yeah. of like trying to limit the world to how this person would see it. And um, Penn's first line is, um, two girls kissing on Instagram. And that just somehow was well, Penn. <laughs> and it just, you know, it just opened up. And Ruth was harder, and I think because closer to me, right? And so it was harder to differentiate her. And um, I made her, you know, gave her a different job because I thought maybe that would help. But um, it's also that I found her, I found a way in Ruth of writing. Um, slightly unlikable character, right? And that was the thing. I was like, well, maybe maybe she's not. Maybe she's tricky. Maybe she's difficult. And that was my way into finding her voice, um, as opposed to trying to make her really sympathetic. Oh, yeah. Um, and it was more, then, then it became fun. It, it's almost connected to that somehow, isn't it? You, yeah. You have, have this person, and you have to see the world from to them to, to nail their voice. Yeah, and I think sometimes, I don't know why I'm saying that thing sometimes, like, I'm, I haven't even written a little bit. Um, for me, it felt like sometimes I did that on the first draft, and sometimes that was a production of editing. And that's why I actually think things like the file called short crack novel or um, terrible first draft, 
is really useful because it acknowledges that first drafts tend to be terrible and that actually the, the art comes with editing and rewriting. And I love rewriting, um, you know, because you're not dealing with a blank page. Um, but uh, it can also be rewriting, it can be also, I'm like, I'm talking about well, the United States, um, can be really hard, right? Because you're facing up to yourself on the page and uh, sometimes, you know, like cover the mirrors, <laughs> don't want to see. <laughs> Um, yeah. And, and being the writer in residence in that, and yeah. off, that's something you went into, obviously, you wanted to go into it, but it must have been a very difficult. Oh, it's a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea. No. Well, this just gives you an insight into my terribly warped personality, which is that I had miscarriages in this hospital, and my niece and my niece and nephew were born in this hospital, and my niece died at birth in the um, Hollister Hospital. And I lived at that time in a flat very close to the hospital. And I would have to invent really long, um, a pedestrian, I don't own a car, and really long circuitous routes places because I couldn't walk past the building. And I just thought, I can't live like that. And so then I got the opportunity to go into the building every day. And everyone around me said, this is a terrible idea. And I was like, no, no, this is a great idea. And um, I'll confront all my ghosts. Um, and it worked. It totally worked, and it was insanely hard. And uh, and then the pandemic happened, and the lockdown meant you know obviously writers are not essential staff, and so I I went home, and that's when I was able to start writing the novel. Right. Um, so I'm really grateful to the staff and the patients at the hospital for the grace that they showed me and for inviting the writer in, which is a really dangerous thing to do, right? Um, but I, yeah, I, I'm also great, grateful is the wrong word, obviously not grateful to the pandemic, but it was a relief to not have to go in every day. And I think, you know, and, that, and I say that publicly, right, you're probably not meant to, um, I say that publicly because I think, you know, it's really important to acknowledge that we make mistakes sometimes and my, I was trying really hard to be resilient and I just I kind of have less and less time for resilience as I get older. I think obviously we need to just get up every day, um, but also, you know, maybe I just needed to stay home. <laughs> yeah, and move away from living next door. <laughs> now you spoke about uh, spending so long home, you were not down and taking energy your class since you're right. Have you found that this as you're really in the right and you find yourself that if a certain time goes past the day and you, you have not been all in bus, or are you more coming in the morning, or is there certain days that start you off like that first cup of coffee and looking at a bad page or a pressure that pop? Like, how have you found this in terms of great routine or something? But it is turned into your routine. Um, so, different at different times, right? One of the things that I love about teaching in a university is that we have these really, really busy periods of the year, like right now. Um, where all the essays are coming in, and then in quiet times of the year. So when it's quiet, I find it relatively easy to have a routine, and I really like mornings. Um, and so I really like, you know, not speaking and not checking my phone and not checking my email and just eating, you know, breakfast and and then go straight to the page. And you know, I don't know what I think that's going to channel my subconscious better. <laughs> yeah, but some kind of weird, but. The other side of that then is because I had that year off, I got really used to that rhythm. And then I went back to my job and I was like, Ugh. right? Um, because I have a full time job and, you know, responsibilities and, you know, family things. And um, so I have become a devotee of the 25 minute writing. And I set an alarm. And I do it. I still do it first thing in the morning, and I maybe do maybe manage it three, maybe four week, week mornings a, a week if I'm lucky. And well, at least one of those mornings will be on the weekend. But it's 25 minutes. I try making it 45 minutes, but 45 minutes actually made the rest of my day too pressured. Um, I was just playing catch up all day. But I can take 25 minutes, and it's um, it's amazing. I mean, I have an insight into half hours dog now, right? Because I set the timer, and I like stare around the room like this for eight minutes, and I'm like. <laughs> And <laughs> right? um, so I've been doing that since January because last semester, from September to December, I wasn't doing anything at all. And I thought, 
I was losing my mind because I, I found this amazing thing that I could do and now I, can, I wasn't doing it. Um, and so since from January to now, I've been doing 25 minutes, I have 25,000 words. Like that's amazing to me, you know? Now, I haven't read any of those words. <laughs> I don't know, but it was free writing. I was just seeing what would come and that's another thing to writing is that um, with my, when I was writing my own life, I knew the plot. <laughs> uh, and then when I was writing with my pen, I had a very careful plot arc worked out. And I thought, oh, we might, the risk this time might be trying to write without knowing what the plan is. And um, so the 25 minutes works for that. <laughs> Matt is standing out there. Right, he's living as a kind of sign. <laughs> Uh, I think we could talk all night. Um, thank you for your time, for your insight, for your honesty once again. Um, I spoke to Emily briefly on the phone earlier in the week and you're just that kind of person. I think we could actually be here all night. Um, <laughs> but, but thank you for your time and to everyone for your, um, yeah. your kindness and your lovely questions. And what an amazing room. Thank you so much. Thank you.